tribute to Saad, the spirit lives on. Uh, this event uh, is, is due almost entirely, I would say, to Bill Jacobson. And uh, uh, Carol Ann, we've got uh, some great people for you to listen to. We were hoping to have Victor Mueller here, but he's not. Dr. Simeon is going to be uh, reading you some remarks that he sent to uh, Dr. Simeon today, so you'll be able to uh, uh, hear what he's saying. Uh, of course, we've got uh, Tim Kolbeck here, you know, who's the uh, president of Saab Parts uh, USA now, and the ex-president of Saab, uh, and he'll be sharing some thoughts. And then, of course, John Moss uh, will get up uh, with, uh, uh, with Bill and, and talk about uh, you know, what Saab was like for the, the long time that he was there. Tomorrow is one of our monthly demo days. We're one of the few museums of our kind in the world where we actually take these cars out and drive them on a regular basis. Now, tomorrow will be an indoor day because of the weather, but <clears throat> tomorrow we're going to bring our Cobra Daytona Coupe and the Ferrari 250 GTO, two of the most iconic race cars ever built here into the center section, and Dr. Simeon is going to do a side-by-side -side evaluation of the two cars, their aerodynamics and mechanical attributes. I can safely say there is no other place in the world where you could see those two cars side-by-side. -side. So uh, very, uh, uh, you know, just almost unique uh, opportunities like that. Uh, so I uh, uh, welcome you to come, sign up for our email newsletter, and uh, become aware of all the things that we do here at the museum. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Simeon to begin our program. You have to bore people sometimes with history, but what's the point of having the story of Saab without a little bit of its background? And Saab has a wonderful history, bringing it up to the, the near future, when they were in financial difficulties, they were ultimately taken over by General Motors. And then General Motors is doing a divestiture process in which they actually got rid of some important uh, marks, um, sold it to uh, a good friend of mine, actually, a guy I met through the car hobby named Victor Mueller. Victor is a Dutchman, um, and you may know him uh, better as the man who designed the Spiker car. For those of you, S-P-Y-K-E-R, for those of you who are interested in, in great sports cars, there's one of the, I guess they're one of the most dynamic, beautiful, and exciting sports cars made. They're, for the high-end market, usually two passenger cars of remarkable design. The name Spiker goes back to the turn of the century. It's a Dutch name. Spiker did not have a long history because the Dutch uh, environment did not uh, really support uh, a luxury car, which it was, but Spiker is famous for building the first six-cylinder engine car. Um, when um, when uh, uh, Walter Muller, Victor Muller took over Spiker, or he invented Spiker really, made some wonderful cars and then had the opportunity to buy Saab, which he did. It's a long, complicated, and somewhat um, a sad story really of how the company ultimately went into receivership, and there were efforts to revive Saab, which were spearheaded again by Victor Mueller and his financial resources. And in Victor's opinion, uh, those um, efforts were blocked by General Motors, which is now part of a lawsuit that's currently going on. Victor was excited to hear that there'd be a Saab meeting at the museum. He's been to the museum a few times. He said, I want to come. I'll be in, in America with this action with the General Motors, but unfortunately that was postponed and postponed and postponed. So some of the questions that we asked him, and I'll make this brief, uh, were very interesting for those of you who are, who are 
particularly fascinated by what's happened to Savard's greatest strengths and weaknesses. And he says, the strengths of Saab are a unique brand, amazing aircraft heritage, which was always made state-of-the-art cars, where safety and drivability were a key. He comments that I love the brand from my childhood because the Dutch importer was established in the street where I lived in Amsterdam. And he grew up with the sound of two-stroke engines, uh, loving Saab for his whole life. So it became fascinating for him to have an opportunity to control the company. Another question we asked is, in your opinion, what were the goals of Saab? Historically, as an established car manufacturer, as a GM subsidiary, and in the most recent period, as an independent entity. And he said, Saab's original mission was to create affordable, safe means of transport with cars which were fun to drive. Under General Motors, the company became a bit of a red-haired stepchild with a lack of clear identity. You can see how a big company like General Motors would, would kind of put in the back corner a much smaller company like Saab. Uh, Spiker, the company he owned, to, sought to bring Saab's identity back and uh, they had a new 9-3, which, and had the new 9-3 seen the light of day, we would have achieved just that. The new 9-3 was the proposed new Saab under Victor's to, uh, control, but it never came to fruition. He talks then about, we asked him then about the sporting role of uh, Saab. In other words, Saab had uh, many successes in design innovations and in rally competition. What aspects of these were most significant to you? Were they exploited? The sporting successes of Saab were very, very important to me when deciding to acquire the company. We definitely wanted to go back to rallying with the Saab 9-1. We intended to make the old Saab 92, 93, and 96 which he designed, or was responsible for his design. We then asked him, you know, what went wrong? Uh, a little bit personal, but, but such an important question. What went wrong is a multi-layered story. The mistake we made from the outset was to be dependent on a government. Uh, the Swedish government had issued a guarantee in favor of the European Investment Bank, which granted Saab a loan of 4 million, 400 million euros. Which we drew, of which we drew 217 million. The influence they had over us was exceptionally unhealthy. But without a loan, we would have never been able to buy Saab in the first place, so it was a take it or leave it. The dependence on General Motors was another weak point, which turned out to be fatal in the end by GM blocking a life-saving cash infusion by a Chinese car maker, Youngman. But there were many, many more reasons, too many to write here, so you can detect some sentimentality as it's obvious that Victor's losing control of the company. Uh, what were the successes? What did he look at as the success of his administration? Getting Saab back onto its feet, launching the 9-5, making a deal with BMW and developing the beautiful new 9-3, which went very well, but it just wasn't enough. The deal with BMW is uh, Saab had a, an agreement under Victor to put BMW engines in the Saab, which would have made a great complication and would have reduced the production cost of the car dramatically. He was then asked, what company do you think is uh, an ideal company that you would like to be like among the others? I would think that Audi would be the ideal example of a company that has made a mere 100 cars 20 years ago and now managed to convert itself from my dad's brand to what it is today, an amazing achievement. So obviously he has great uh, respect for uh, um, Audi. And then in, in closing, he, he was asked what has happened to the industry in general that he thinks will affect the future of the company. Modern technologies have totally changed our industry in the past few years. The development process has been shorted by, shortened by years and the costs are as a result as well. The main thing for Saab was to remain independent and, and save for teaming up with another large uh, manufacturer for engine, which was BMW. We did just that. Finally, the last thing is, as you may know, there's a consortium which has purchased um, the bankruptcy sale of Saab for 170 million euros. Uh, this company is called NEBS, and uh, Tim knows what that stands for. New Electric Vehicle Sweden, NEBS. So it's obvious where they're going. Um, he asked, 
uh, what, what's going to happen to this? And their goal, of course, is to build a, a, an electric vehicle. He's not sure that a business model would work because the electric car is simply not a viable product. He would favor reinducing, reintroducing the old 93 as they intended to do, but that's not being considered. Um, <clears throat> they also want to know um, why they're in such a hurry to induce an, another model when they could uh, not sell them previously at a profit. How they could be sold at a profit three or four years later where the brand has suffered so much as to what has happened in the past years. So he's not sure that that model is going to work. And right now, there, there's an attempt by the people who've taken over uh, what's left of Saab to determine through the dealers, and I just learned through Tim, uh, are you guys going to be interested in selling electric cars here in America? So this little talk I gave replaces uh, Victor Mueller, who had planned to be here. He would love talking to him, because this guy literally out of his back pocket bought Saab, tried to save it, and it's a, it's a dramatic story, which you can find online in more detail. Now, let's go, let's go into the future. We're lucky today to have the man who represents Saab here in America. His name, as you probably all know, is Tim Colbeck. He was recent president of Saab North America, and he's currently the CEO of Saab Automobile Parts here in America. His career was many, many years with Subaru before he went over to become CEO of, uh, of Saab here in America. And uh, he's been a very interesting addition, I'm sure, in many ways will be more interesting than, than um, Victor Mueller's comments because he's right here working with us. Tim? Thank you. And to drive in that parking lot, it's, uh, it's like another museum. Out in the parking lot, it's unbelievable. I pulled up, I have a, I have a black 95 uh, 2011 Arrow, and I parked right next to an incredibly clean 94X black, and it just looked like something out of a movie. It was great. Uh, and then you walk by all the classic sobs, and, and uh, just a pleasure to be here. And, and I want to thank Bill for, for sharing his collection with us. So I, I'm probably one of the more recent additions to, to Saab, to, to the company Saab, and, and so I'll start. They asked to, to share a little bit of insights about the company. I'll start with, with my first day. And, and my first day was Mother's Day two years ago, in 2011. Who, who remembers what they were doing that day? Now, some of us do. I remember because I was driving down 95. I'm, I'm actually a, a Philadelphia uh, area native. I uh, worked for Subaru, which is right in Cherry Hill. Joined Saab, and they were having the 94X launch. It's, it was a press launch. It was at the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, in Georgetown, beautiful place. And I'm driving down and I see a billboard for the 95. And I remember that billboard, I'd seen it months before, before I ever really was engaged with Saab. And I remember thinking two things. What a beautiful car, was my first thought. And then my second thought is, why is Saab doing billboards, right? It, you know, it's, how could you be more mass market than doing billboards? So it, it had me scratch my head a little bit. So as I drove down, I started an exercise of counting billboards and counting sobs. And guess what? By the time I got down there, the billboards won. There were six billboards, four sobs. And, and that, that kind of pointed to something that, that was fundamentally wrong with the way that we were approaching things. And, and it was one of the things that actually attracted me to sob. When I got there, it was like any car launch. If you've been to a car launch, they're great. They're filled with optimism. You have the press there. Uh, the engineers were there. And, and, and Victor was there. Jason Castriato was there. So think about that as your first day. You drive into Georgetown to the Rich Carl. There's an open bar. You're talking to Jason. You're talking to Victor. And all the engineers were there. It was great. So I start trying to leverage the fact that the engineers are there. And I start asking them about what is the spirit of Saab. And the first few folks I spoke to gave me kind of what you might expect. It's, it's innovation, it's, it's real world safety, it's exhilarating performance, it's all these things. And I talked to Peter George, who, who some of you may know, who was the lead on 94X, and he says, no, it's none of those things. What's at the heart of Saab and the spirit of Saab is that everything we do has the care of the driver in mind. And, and to me, that was pretty fundamental to why we do what we do. It wasn't what we did, it was why we did what we did. It was, it was a key thing. We went out with the press, they loved the car. We're driving, they're giving me all this positive feedback, and they say, but, hey Tim, is the company gonna make it? That was the question I got the most. The question I got the second most was, are you nuts? <laughs> so, let me take a step back and tell you why I'm not nuts. 1985, I had a Saab SPG. 
Now I'm here at Turbo SPG 1985. It was the first car I loved, right? It was the first car that it really meant something to me. It wasn't just a commodity. I, I, and I got that car because it was distinctive. It was different. Nobody had it. It, it had a lot more performance and, and, and standard feet. It had a lot more than every, 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 everything else in its class. But the one thing it had that I thought was really cool was you felt like you were driving something that was the best kept secret. You, when you were driving that, you knew something about it that nobody else knew. And, and that's what I liked. I, I had that car for, for about four years. It was the first car I had when I, when I first started dating my wife. Um, not that that was a factor, I think, in, in the decision to date me. But uh, I, I got rid of it in 1990. I worked for Subaru. I started to stop. And I, I went into a world of, of manufactured demos, right? So I, that was the last car I owned before the next car I owned, which is a 9-5-2011. I had demos all, all the years in between. So th that was kind of what, what set the stage for Saab. I had a connection with Saab, and I watched what happened to Saab during the GM years. And a little bit of the edge came off, and it went from being unique and distinctive to the adjective that they were using was quirky, right? It, 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 and it's a fine line, and, and I didn't like that at all. Uh, when it went independent, I had my eye on it. And then when I got the call that, hey, are you interested? I, I had my first meeting with Victor. And Victor is a very charismatic guy. And my first meeting with Victor was via Skype. So we're sitting on Skype. It's a Saturday. He's in Mallorca at, at his house there. And he's going through his, his thoughts about the brain. I'm talking about my thoughts about the brain. And we connected. Uh, we knew that the brain needed to change. We knew that the brain's future was seated in its past, but it wasn't its past. We, and and we, it, it was a great conversation. It, it culminated with, with him having his cell phone up to the Skype camera showing me the 9-3 mom. And, and you could just see what a passionate guy he was about the brand. I, I've been 25 years with the Japanese, and, and it, great company, but the passion never comes through. It, if, if, you know, it, it, it was just something unique. And then something happened right around three quarters of the way in this interview. You know, you're on Skype and you see these hands come into the picture with an 18-month-year-old boy. His son, right? I guess he was acting up and his wife got sick of him. He's like, you take it. So, so we, finish, we finish the interview and he's got his son on his lap. And I, I thought, I'm like, who, thought, you know, who interviews to run a company with a guy? We, we, we're sharing cell phone photos and, and, and I'm talking to his son. You know, and, and it was just different, and it was really attractive to me. But there was a big issue, and, and that was, you know, as we continued to talk, I met him at the New York Auto Show, they stopped producing cars. The, the company was running out of financing, and Victor said, don't worry, I, I've, got, I've got a plan, we're going to bring in Chinese funding. And in, in late April, there was a press conference, he made a deal with Hot Top. I call him up, I'm like, Victor, that's it, I'm ready, let's go. Back now to the launch. Tuesday morning, second wave of press comes in. We're having breakfast, and, and Victor gets up and says, I got to go. I'm like, all right, I'll see you later. He goes, no, no, no. I'm going to China. This deal's falling through. And that began the roller coaster that, that was my ride with Saab. Uh, by the time I got to the office in Royal Oak, a new deal had been written with Panda. And uh, so there was, there was a lot of hope. And, and as I met all the employees of Saab, I knew one thing, as I looked at the financials and I saw the people and I heard the stories, I knew this wasn't going to be easy. But I also knew there was no turning back, that, that I made a commitment to the brand and we were going to see what we could do to save it. And I was actually very confident that we could save it for one reason. I mean, it's the reason that everybody's here. It was the passion of that core group of owners. No brand evokes the type of ca uh, passion that solved it. And knowing that, it seemed like, man, if it can have this type of connection, with this group of people, it can have a much bigger connection with a bigger group of people. So that's what really attracted me to, to, the, to the opportunity at Saab. And, and that's what, what, what made me want to get in the flight and try to save it. And we had a great time from, from, from May through about September developing the plan to relaunch the, the company. And I think it was a pretty strong plan. We had all the support of Victor and, and, and in Sweden. But as you know, in September, that's when the parent company went into reconstruction. It was actually on my birthday, September 8th. They went into reconstruction. And uh, that was, in a way, a good thing because that meant that the company was seen to be uh, strong enough to be reorganized. And when the funding came in, uh, they'd, be, they'd be able to relaunch. 
Now, the issue is we all have been looking this way and saying, man, the, the, the big obstacle to this, this funding is the Chinese government. You know, we've got to get them to approve the funding. And, and the deal started changing over time because of the shape of the company, and it became more and more uh, financed, and, and Victor was giving up more control of the company. Well, it was right around that time, end of October, early November, that GM started to murmur a little bit. It was a small voice at first that became a very big voice. And at, one, at that point in time, they basically said, no, you know what? We're not sharing this technology. And when they got to that point, that's when the suitors backed off. And December 19th of 2011, the company declared bankruptcy, which was not, I, I can tell you on December 18th, we were exchanging emails and texts. We thought we were still going to be able to get something done. December 19th, we went into bankruptcy. And I can tell you, um, it's, it's a, hopefully a once in a lifetime experience going through bankruptcy. It's a cold process. Um, it's an unbelievably cold process. There, there's no feeling for, for what the brand was. There's no feeling for what the, the owner's needs are. There's no feeling for what the dealer's needs are. Uh, it's all about seeing how much money can you get for this company in the quickest amount of time. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's a tough process to go through. But as we were going through that, we tried to save as much as we could of the company, and then we started looking to the future. And there was really only one way to ensure that the brand could go forward at that point. And that was through supporting the brand through parts of service. And when the opportunity came up to make the move to that company, I jumped at it because I didn't want to leave the company the way it was in bankruptcy. I want to leave it much better. And, and you know, thankfully, we can play a role in doing that. So, so as a new company formed on June 1st uh, of last year, it bought the parts from the bankrupt shop. It bought the distribution rights from, from the bankrupt shop. And in that week, we went out and asked the former shop dealers, hey, do you want to be service centers? We weren't sure what to expect at that point, because they had gotten burned too. All but five signed up. And after that, we've, been, we've had people knocking on the door to become service centers, and it's something that we're, uh, we're looking at expanding just to make sure that we have enough geograph geographically to, to serve all the owners. So that was great. We got the network in place. But the availability was terrible. During bankruptcy, the old company couldn't replenish any parts. So we had to go and go from a 42% fill rate from orders uh, up to a 95% fill rate in orders in about three months. So it was a huge amount of parts that, that came over. So that was the next thing. Then the next thing was the owners. How do we support the owners that have been, been, been left abandoned? Now General Motors had stepped up and said, we're gonna administer, or we're gonna, we're gonna honor warranties for the cars sold under our watch. Uh, but the process wasn't great. So we signed a deal with them that all of our service centers now can do the GM warranty work. And so now for everyone 09 and prior, they had a place to go for warranty work. All right, the 10s and 11s, the toughest thing. That, Really, the thing that breaks your heart is that the company that, that sold those cars is no longer in existence. So we had to think of something for them. And we put together a deal, and hopefully you've been to the Saab website if you own one of those cars, uh, called Saab Secure. And Saab Secure uh, gives you a free initial service, and it kicks in a partnership we have with a company called BG to give you an engine warranty. We also struck a partnership with Allstate uh, through one of their subsidiary companies to have a, uh, a vehicle service contract, essentially a duplicate warranty at a very affordable rate. Essentially, we're not charging any markup and we're asking our dealers not to charge any markup. So you can get uh, a very good policy at an affordable rate, which is kind of the best we could do with that. And it's not a perfect solution, but it, but it helps at least to get the, the tens and elevens supported. I know I've, I'm, I've got an 11, I'm, I'm buying an all-state warranty. So that, that's kind of where we stand right now. I've got a couple of things here that I want to share. It's our com commemorative Saab Forever poster, which is really the, the, the first piece that we have uh, coming out to just help get the word out, because there's not a lot of awareness, honestly, of the new company. I'm, I'm going to share this with uh, Dr. Simeon. I, I want you to have one, and I want, I want Bill, you to have one. We've got two frames. Fred, I think this 
So, you know, as, as we continue to move forward with the brand, it, the, the theme is the spirit of the spirit of South here tonight. And, and I can say that, that I, I went to the owners rally. So people I've met in my experience uh, with Saab are unbelievable. There's car companies that would kill for the type of loyalty that Saab has. You know, think about the fact that this event is twice well attended as any other event by the company that couldn't sell enough cars. There's something wrong, right? There's something wrong with that. So I, I love the theme of this event and, and glad that we could we could participate. We want to see the spirit of Saab live on forever. And, and Dr. Sumi, I have one last thing. I, I don't know, there, there's an iconic photograph that, that captures the spirit of Saab back when. I think most of you people know Eric Carlson, right? And, and the famous photo of him with his car on its roof and drinking a beer saying, oh well, I guess this was a rough day. Oh. <laughs> I want to share that with you because this, this kind of embodies the, the can-do spirit of Saab. And if there's one thing, if you think about Saab in the future, that uh, I can guarantee you is that you can't predict what's going to happen next. I, I know in my, my experience with Saab, every corner is a new surprise, and I think the future is going to be surprising to us all, and hopefully it's a pleasant surprise. So thanks again for your, your patience, and thanks for your support. And, and if you do own a, a, a Saab, definitely come to our website, Saab.com, and, and learn about how we can support you. Thank you. I want to introduce, um, actually hard to introduce since everybody seems to know, Bill Jacobson. And he's kind of the glue that keeps the, uh, the whole local Saab people involved. He has really more than any individual, they're entirely responsible for not only the cars, but the enthusiasm and the contacts. And we have a little bit of appreciation for you and Carol, who have put this all together. And uh, Bill's final uh, uh, obligation tonight is to introduce our next and last guest, and so I'm going to turn it over to you, Bill. Thank you. It's been such an honor to, take to be able to stand up here and show off and have all my cars on display and introduce probably one of the finest men that I know, John Ross, to talk and tell us all about his experience with 37 years working for Saab. So here's John. Anybody that doesn't, I've, again, 37 years with Saab. I started back in 1968 when I kind of wandered in needing work. They needed a B technician who was willing to work for $3.65 an hour. And uh, it was a temporary job that lasted a lifetime, and I wouldn't have traded it for the world. And any other company, I might have made it to an A technician, but uh, I went on to uh, you know, technical training, spent a lot of time in Sweden, and have spent a lot of time kind of wondering, you know, again, the spirit of Saab, the history of Saab. I approached it kind of from the other end. Uh, you know, went back to, uh, let me go back to the beginning, actually, and uh, was trying to think of the major elements as to what created a car that created so much passion, that grabbed so many people, you know, bring them out you know, under circumstances like today. So one of the things that came out loud and clear was just the you know, the, the essence of the people that built the darn thing. Uh, I, I can see, in my eye, and you know, an awful lot of the Swedes that I knew, uh, the Swedes that went before them, uh, in the character of the car. And being a small company, you can almost, it's neat, because you can look, sometimes look at a wiring diagram and, and say, oh, Thomas is still there. You know, it's, I'm not sure how many companies you could, you know, you could see that kind of, you know, individual, you know, detail. Anyway, the, the people, just the Swedes, and I spent a lot of time over there, uh, but it's all one man's opinion. Um, the car, you know, the essence of the car for me is very decent and straightforward, and that's kind of the way I always found the Swedes. I'm sure there's some miserable ones out there, but I think they locked them up and hit them when I was there, because I never met, a, you know, never met a Swede I didn't, didn't like, pretty much. Uh, they, like everybody else, they got some quirks and got some warts, but uh, one of the couple of things and you know, a few stories, 
kind of bring that out. Uh, first of all, they're very pragmatic, very practical, uh, kind of straightforward people. Uh, refreshingly absent, uh, or lack of lawyers, I think, in some ways. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of my favorite moments was uh, traveling on up. I used to go up and visit a friend up in Norway, and up on the border, uh, river crossing between uh, Sweden and Norway, there's a big old uh, fort up on a you know, tall bluff, commands the river, and it's swapped back and forth for centuries, but still in use up until uh, probably the Second World War. Uh, hundreds of feet on down, rocky cliffs down into the uh, end of the river below, and whereas in America you'd have chain link fence with barbed wire and 17 warning signs, you get up there and, and look, and all you see is a sign that says, uh, you know, caution, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to fall off the cliff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a real straightforward approach to things. Um, basic, yeah, well, I'd have to say honesty. There's a lot of other terms you can probably, probably apply to it, but, uh, you know, they want to do the right thing. You know, it's a great place to be. I'm sure it's changing, but you could always wander around in the middle of the night and not much worry about whether you're going to get back home again safely or not. Uh, again, back to the honesty thing. You saw it come out clearly. I was over there in 94 and 95 working on the implementation of OBD2 regulations. And uh, it, was, it was a challenge because you're depending on, dependent on the uh, EPA, which will never tell you really what they want and came out of a meeting one time where the Swedes were doing their darndest to, to comply with these rather fuzzy regulations and one of the engineers looked over at me and said, John, don't you think that maybe we Swedes are a little too honest? Shouldn't we be like the Italians that have rules for everything and ignore every one of them? <laughs> and uh, you know they were going to turn around, he was going to do his dog on this to make sure that everything was picture perfect legal, but uh, uh, they had a just to wish they could be like the rest of the world there. Um, but they always did the right thing. If you look at that uh, cutaway 9000 up in the back there, the, you know, the beauty of that is you can see an awful lot of the detail as far as all the inner reinforcement, all the safety structure that's there. And you know, most car companies, you put that sort of thing in there to get a five-star rating so you look good in the ads. You know, with the Saab, the, the Swedes put that in there so you lived. You know, that, that was their focus. Yeah, the five-star writing. <laughs> they were serious about it. It was uh, always neat when you were over there to wander past the uh, crash testing building, which was just looked like a big, long, uh, tar paper-covered greenhouse, but occasionally you'd hear this long whiz and a thump, and you know they had just, uh, you know, just crashed another car, and they'd crash them again. And again, I wandered by one time, and uh, probably most of you have heard about the, uh, the moose test. Uh, if, if you haven't, um, big deal in Sweden is not getting killed by mooses. Uh, rascals are about, bellies about that far off the ground, and uh, you run along and pick one up with the front of your car, and it goes through the windshield, and it's kind of a bad day for everybody. So, uh, you know, a lot of the structure that you see in the eight colors on that 9,000 uh, have to do with keeping a moose on your lap. And the way that they tested was, uh, you look over on the ground there, and here is a big old bundle of telephone cables, floppy, heavy, insulated cables, uh, weigh about the same as a moose does, and they would suspend them on chains and drag the car on through. And uh, that was kind of pleased that I finally got to see the famous uh, moose test cables there. And looked over, and there was a car that uh, had obviously, first glance, had, a, had an appointment with the moose there. But looked over at the windshield and started picking hair out of it and realized that uh, you know, not only had they uh, you know, tested it artificially, but they were dragging in cars in real life. Uh, I, I know at one point they had a kind of a reaction team that would go out and uh, every time there was a serious accident they'd go look at the car and study it and uh, bring back. And again, it's just a detail that uh, it was the sort of thing that they did, not because they had to, but because it was right. And, you know, it spoke volumes to me about the Swedish character. Uh, there was a, they were kind of a flip side to it. Uh, uh, one of the things that was a little hard to live with is they, 
I, th I think as a rule, have a much better balance between family and life and how to live things. And one of the most remarkable things is they just all go on vacation for most of the summer, or it seems that way, you know, four or five weeks or so, which leaves this big black hole over the factory, and uh, we think the janitor answers the mail, but, uh, you know, at any rate, uh, um, you just knew you weren't going to get a whole lot done in the, uh, in the summertime, but yeah, that had its plus side, too. I remember one summer back, and I guess it was 96, getting a, you know, back then it was a telex, you didn't get an email, getting a telex, would you mind going to Nicaragua? They got a bunch of broken cars down there, and we're not going to go fix them, at least not until September. So uh, that was one of the better trips of my life, was going finding out that uh, volcanic ash doesn't mix well with ignition systems. But, uh, you yeah. um, know. Anyhow, that was kind of the, the people side of things. I love the Swedes to pieces. They are, are grand, grand people, and it comes through the car. You can see a lot of the... Swedish character in the vehicle itself. Okay, uh, another not so probably pleasant formative part of the, uh, uh, you know, what made a Saab a Saab was, was money. And uh, in the beginning, I'll go back to that, because being an old guy, that's where my focus is. Uh, you know, first of all, it wasn't even a given that Saab was going to build cars. You know, a lot of you have been, been with us a long, long time and realized that uh, near the end of World War II, uh, we were going to start had to do something. We're not going to build a whole lot of more, you know, a whole lot of warplanes. So that we could have gone the route, one possibility was to end up like Grumman building canoes, uh, prefabricated buildings. Uh, somebody said, well, let's build a car. So, you know, we did. Um, not a whole lot of funding for it. Uh, I think the original 8,000 cars were spoken for by uh, the Swedish equivalent of a mega dealer called Philipsons. And, uh, they agreed to buy 8,000 cars, and that provided the funding to, uh, you know, design and build the, uh, you know, the first cars. Uh, there were times when we made money, but generally we uh, managed to dispose of it fairly quickly. And, uh, but, you know, for the most part, what I remember as an employee was you'd always get these financial statements that said, uh, well, as an average, the results were not entirely satisfactory. Uh, you know, we were always tied in with somebody. Uh, family you may have heard the name Wallenberg. Uh, group provided us a lot of funding. We ended up married to, uh, you know, named through our glory years there was Saab Scania. We were tied in with the uh, Scania Vavis Truck Works, which, uh, you know, gave us some money to keep going. And then finally, uh, you know, we picked GM's pocket for a while until that came to an end. Um, so there was a lot of it. In some ways, that wasn't a bad thing. Uh, you find it probably forced a lot, again, a lot of the character of the car was you had to do a lot with a little. We ended up with a lot of very clean design solutions. Uh, to me, the essence of Swedish engineering was, was a, you know, clean, clever, simple ways of accomplishing an end. You compare a lot of what happened in the, oh, in the 70s and 80s, looking under the hood of a Saab, looking under the hood of an American car or a, or a Japanese car, and we didn't have a miles and miles of vacuum hose. We had good solid engineering. We, we found ways of building a, a great car in a pretty straightforward and simple way. So that was a, that was a positive. Uh, negative was uh, a kind of recurring theme. Um, there were an awful lot of times where cars came to market a few years before they were really ready. And we kind of used you guys as the final uh, uh, evaluation and development team on, on a few of the cars. You know, so the 99 certainly, uh, a couple of others, uh, they turned into great cars, but it took a little bit of time. So money was always a factor. Uh, you know, it just wasn't the last couple of years that it became, uh, you know, became an issue. It was sort of the, you know, the history of our life uh, you know, that way. Okay, I just something else I, I found to find the, the way the car came about was the, uh, certainly the, the conditions, the environment that it, uh, it started off in. Uh, 1947, World War II was over, but most of Europe was, was devastated. Uh, there were material restrictions, you couldn't move cash around very much. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of ac uh, access to production, to parts. 
you know, from the outside. So pretty much everything got done in house, um, and it was done with you know a very small team. Uh, I'm sure you've already have all heard of the original uh, you know, the story of the original team. Most of the handful of engineers didn't even have driver licenses. They you know rode bicycles to work. Uh, my boy over here was a, uh, and talking to Stefan Baba too, they both participated in a uh, school project called Formula SAE, you know, building race cars in, uh, you know, in college classes. And I'm willing to bet that the, uh, probably the, the car that my son built had more engineers working on it than perhaps the first, uh, you know, first saw there. But you know, they were aircraft engineers, they were great people. Um, first car, uh, just again, a little a sidetrack, a little bit of history though. Uh, Saab number one, which still exists in the museum, you folks I'm sure have seen pictures and even the wooden models of it, uh, that was really built on a shoestring. Uh, that still has the original DKW drivetrain that came out of a junkyard, uh, you know, near, uh, near the aircraft plant. Uh, still runs. The car itself was uh, hand-built, uh, a couple of body men in the, uh, in, in the crew here, and process in for building a, you know, a, a one-off car, a prototype, was he shook, took a sheet of tin and built what was known as a buck, looked almost like the frame of a wooden boat that gave you the shape of the car, and they needed to proceed to beat the stuffings out of the panel to uh, uh, create the form of the car. Um, now the conventional way of beating a panel like that is usually take something like a lead bag and uh, fill it with sand and take some wooden mallets and, uh, and uh, repeatedly just pound on the metal until it takes shape. Uh, don't know if it's true, but the story I was told by a Swede was that the uh, body man they used for this car had a little different slant on things. Uh, you know, in the first place, it apparently wasn't a model of sobriety, and, uh, which as a body man might not be a, Tremendous shock to some of you, but uh, yeah. Anyhow, uh, so he had a different outlook on life, and apparently he didn't like leather and sand. But it found out that uh, apparently just very mature horse manure gave exactly the right resilience to uh, you know to, to form your metal there. So uh, here, this this car that put us on the map, the first Saab. If I can believe my Swedish source, and I can't believe a Swede would lie to me. Um, I always found it on horse manure. So, uh, you know. At any rate, so that was, uh, that was kind of our, our start in things. Um, another thing that kind of made the car, you know, unique where it is, is quite honestly, Trollhotten is not the center of the universe. It's a very nice place, but it's, it's kind of off in left field there. And uh, as a result, you can't say the car was built in a vacuum, but because of the some of the restrictions I mentioned earlier, the you know, lack of availability of uh, just going down to the corner store and saying, well, I'll have that engine and that axle. Uh, pretty much everything got designed and built in-house. I think the original content, the content for the original cars, all but about 17% was made right in the factory there. The upholstery, the transmission, the engine, uh, everything. About the only thing that ended up getting bought out were the uh, old things from no, SU fuel pumps, Lockheed brakes, uh, Bosch electrics, but everything else was either made in the factory or in little job shops around the area in Trollhutton there. So you got a car that had an awful lot of local content and a lot of, a lot of character, and it was designed you know, specifically for that one car. It was, uh, you know, it was unique to Saab. All right, so that's kind of the, the, the background of of how the first cars came into you know came into play. Now later on they you know they, they certainly got more mainstream, they got more complex, but they were real slow in losing their character. I, you know I can't can't run down GM too much because without their money we would have been dead long before we uh, you know we were. But uh, um, we started perhaps to lose, as Tim said, to lose our individual individuality when uh, GM came along. But certainly through the classic 900s, there was still a lot of the old Saab character there. Uh, again, a little bit of a digression. Uh, uh, one of the best body classes I had was uh, brought an old time 
If, you, if you're an old 900 driver, if you look real carefully, you find that uh, one of the doors hardly ever fit. Uh, usually the corner of the front doors would tick the, uh, uh, tick the frame a little bit and chip the paint. And you find out that it was, well, we always start welding on this side of the car and go over all the way around and around and around. By the time you get to here, nothing really fits that well anymore. <laughs> you know? And that was, that was the way it was. You know, they, they were doing the best they could, but uh, again, due to the lack of money, it's the downside. Is once you started in uh, committing into a project, if you had a good idea, it was great. If you had a bad idea, you had a sinking feeling you're going to be seeing that bad idea for the next 20 years or so, because there just was never, never the money to change it. So you learned to cope, and that was that, uh, you know, that body class that I had on the 900. They called it wee-ha-ha, -ha, which was wood hammer hydraulic. It was the, uh, you know, that was the process for, for making a, an old 900 fit. And this, you know, spent about a half a day finding out how to make the, uh, uh, how to make the headlights fit, and then how to, the big thing was how do you make the right front door fit. So I had this, uh, you know, spine of suite that hauls out the port of power, and puts the back corner down there and the front corner up there and starts jacking. And here's the gate pillar and the windshield going because of course you have to push metal past the point where you want it to be. So you have to go forward and forward and finally swing back. And I said, so look at it, and this windshield was just so the inevitable question, well, how do you know when you've gone too far? Well, that's easy, the windshield breaks. <laughs> Okay. So that was, and that was in the 1980s there, Saab still had that character. And again, love him dearly, but there were things that like that just went, uh, you know, went on and on, almost till the end. Okay, now I could ramble and ramble, but it's, uh, you've got better things to do. I'd just like to kind of get into talking about a couple of the people that I think, uh, you know, really made Saab what it was, and what for us, what, you know, for us what it still is. Um, first one wasn't even a Swede. Uh, a fellow by the name of Ralph Millet. Uh, and Ralph is the fellow that started Saab in the U.S. And a uh, great, great fellow. I think he actually started not, well, I know he didn't start as a car company. He, uh, he started with a liaison with the aircraft division and kind of became an unwilling president uh, of the car side of things when he was, Sven Wenlo or whoever it was, called up and said, uh, Ralph, how would you like to sell some cars? We're going to build cars. You know, Ralph says, not on your life, and Sven says, well, good, they're on the ship, go down to the port and unload them. And uh, so, you know, start in with, uh, you know, with selling sobs, and, you know, started, of course, in the Northeast, and you went around, anybody that knew how to fix an outboard motor or a farm tractor ended up being a sob dealer. Or if you, or if you, could, if you could leave three cars in the front yard of a gas station with a promise to appear later, if somebody sold them, that was, you're a sob dealer. And, and it worked. That's the main, we had some great, great mom and pop stores that, uh, you know, were in there till the end, just uh, devoted folks. Um, Ralph was a wonderful, wonderful man. About the only criticism I ever heard of him when I was working with him was he's just too doggone nice to be in the car business. It was, it was a real gentleman. Um, one of the cars out front here. Uh, Stefan Bapa brought one of the Quantums, that, that beautiful beast with the spaghetti strainer is at the back of the uh, wheel wells there, if you haven't had a chance to look at it there. Uh, that was an offshoot of a friend of uh, uh, Ralph Mills called Walter Kern, who started developing uh, uh, sports cars and did it kind of on the sly. I think Ralph slipped him a bunch of bits and pieces and whatever funny it break loose and uh, very unofficial but ended up with you know cars like that and you know eventually cars like that and uh, we did a lot again because we had to lot with a little uh, most of the New England dealers ice raced it was a way of getting uh, getting the word out making uh, making the car known to people and, and again it was uh, for the most part uh, uh, we'd give them engines, we'd give them transmissions. Some of the dealers even got into our demo program. That was, uh, you know, again, the things that went on in the old days would curl your hair, not only what they called trust receipt, where you'd ship your cars and uh, you pay for them if you remember to. But uh, we have a car, you know, demo car program where the, uh, some of the less scrupulous dealers would take uh, 
brand new 96, take all the fenders and doors, makes racing. Uh, come spring, put the fender, the clean fenders and doors back on and uh, put them on the lot here as low mileage uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, demo cars. And yeah, we knew it was going on, but it got the word out there. People found out about Saab. And I remember for years looking in the New York Times uh, and seeing the ads for Saab that, uh, okay, we Saab has won more races than any other car in the world, uh, or more rallies than any other car in the world. And it was, uh, it was through the likes of Eric Carlson and, and Ralph Millett. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was a defining part of the way we were. Okay, Ralph is a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, next fellow, we've already been mentioned once or twice, Eric Carlson. Uh, I think probably half the people in this room at least have met Eric or knew Eric. Uh, great bear of a man, you know, great racer. Uh, Took Saab from, you know, pretty much nothing, put us on the map, winning the Monte Carlo Rally twice, uh, a number of other significant races. But again, kind of things that are, I think of when I think of Eric Carlson. Uh, one of the early stories, or one of the stories I got from him one time talking was going back to the world of lack of money with uh, Saab. When he was starting out, I guess it was a struggle just to get a car out of the uh, uh, administration. And then, uh, he had the audacity to go back and ask for a second set of tires. And of course, anybody in the, you know, know how things are done today, rally teams have monstrous budgets. Uh, wasn't the case with Saab. Um, if you look at the seatbelts in the RAC car, the red car that he won the RAC rally in 1960 with, those were wide belts out of the Saab fighter jet that he'd scrounged off of the scrap pile because they were too frayed and out of date to be good in the plane, that they worked just fine in a race car and they were free. Uh, again, going back to the second set of tires for his, uh, one of his early rally efforts, uh, you know, he got a very stern look from whoever it was at the factory he was talking to at the factory and the, well, Mr. Carlson, we just gave you a car with four brand new tires, which could you possibly need extras for? And I guess that was the end of the discussion there, that, uh, but, you know, I can't even begin to, uh, you know, give you a, a clear picture of Eric. He's just a much larger than life person. But the last thing I'll leave you with is an event that really stuck in my mind because I was going through the airport in, uh, oh, near Gothenburg one time. Didn't see Eric, but I heard this big bellow, you know, John. And here he comes lumbering across the, uh, across the hall there. Uh, Lord knows how he knew me. He knew everybody. If you were female, he knew you even better if he had any, you know, anything to say about it. But at uh, uh, any rate, just he was such a you know straightforward, outgoing, warm person that here he could have walked away, and uh, you know I'd never known the difference. But he went out of his way to come over, and we had a nice conversation, and each went our own way. Just a, a genuine, wonderful, wonderful person. Okay, next suite I'd like to talk about, uh, probably most of you know his name, uh, Per Gilbrand. Uh, if you followed Saab at all, if you, certainly if you know anything, if you've looked at that uh, you know, delightful 78 Turbo out there, uh, Per Gilbrand's name comes up. Uh, he was an engineer, his specialty was engines. He started way back in the, uh, you know, in the V4 days. Uh, Again, if you know a bit of Saab history, the two-stroke element, love them dearly, but uh, you know, the, the folks in, uh, in favor of two-strokes were so well entrenched, the thought of anything ever replacing it was heresy. So the V4 had to be done surreptitiously, you know, off-site, and kind of stuck in during uh, summer break there. Uh, anyway, Perry Gilbrand was part of that operation. He was responsible for the uh, two-liter engine replaced with wonderful 17185 Triumph engines we had for a few years in the early 99s. Uh, he developed the uh, the turbo. He developed DIAPC. He was there just. He, it was again some of what was the best in Swedish engineering. He was a person that had his arms around the entire project, and that's what I always found unique about Saab is that you run into people that knew the entire car or a major lump of the entire car. 
not like a big organization where you have somebody in charge of left-handed door handles or uh, you know rear view mirrors. You got the people that knew the entire vehicle and you know just were able to uh, affect huge change just by you know their own sheer brilliance and force of personality. Again, he was a very straightforward, um, unassuming person. Uh, I put together a car one time for an SAE convention where he wanted two fuel tanks so he could have one full of crummy gas and one full of good gas so he could show all the American engineers the difference in boost when you switch from good gas to bad gas. And this is something I did probably in 1981. You know, 10, 20 years later, he you know, remembered that. And uh, you get this very genuine, John, you know, I've got to come out, uh, come out to my house, which I hate to say I, I didn't. I really wish I did, because what you'd find at Perry Gilbrand's house is just this fantastic collection of engines. He had a, just a capacity. He would design engines. He'd collect engines. Uh, prime piece, I really am sorry I missed, is he'd somehow rode through his buddies in the Swedish military managed to scrounge up a Merlin engine, uh, you know, Spitfire B-12 uh, Rolls-Royce, uh, stacks about that long on it they had on a, on a cradle. And on warm summer evenings, he'd roll out into the uh, into the driveway and light off to the delight of the entire neighborhood. So, uh, you know, just again, a wonderful, wonderful person. All right, I, I could go on and on, but hopefully, I've given you at least a glimpse of what one man's view. What I found so doggone appealing about the car is the fact that you you had a bunch of wonderful people who came together and created a car that, quite honestly, I started with, my first sob was a joke. Uh, I needed a car, I had $30, for $30 I could put together a two-stroke, I thought it was the most preposterous thing I'd ever seen in my life, and I fell in love with the doggone thing. I just, I never wanted to drive anything else after that first car. And uh, it's, again, been the ride of a lifetime. It took me from $3.65 an hour to a career that, I would have done over again for free. So I'll be around for the rest of the evening. You want to talk about cars or anything else, track me down. As always, thank you so much for putting up with me, and it's a pleasure to talk to you. I just want to say how pleased and happy I am that all you took time to come here from Colorado, Georgia, and all over. Um, Dr. Simeon, for being so kind to let me have this opportunity. Daryl, who was the inspiration on keeping on Dr. Simeon to make sure it happened. Kevin, who helped do so much on organizing and making my cars look so beautiful. Um, my sister, Carol Ann, who did all of the running around, getting the posters, doing all of the internet and all the things that I don't like to do. My, my wife and my two kids who are putting up with me, my mother-in-law who stepped up and helped pick up the kids from school when I couldn't, and everybody here that just made the whole event extra special. Thank you. Everybody, please, tell your friends. Let's get some people out here. We need to let more people know how great this place is because it's right in our backyards, and we really need to have people come and see all these beautiful cars that Dr. Simeon's been able to preserve for us all. Thank you.